Good evening, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Henrietta Toivonen, and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. As leaders around the world are taking their countries to the 21st century, each of them are faced with different set of decisions and challenges. When the country in question is China, with its 1.4 billion people from di diverse geographic regions and ethnic groups, the issues of leadership and governance become extremely complex. The intricate dynamics of Chinese political culture and heritage, as well as the diverse relations the country has diplomatically, further complicate our ability to understand the context of leadership in China. Professor Susan Shirk is going to focus on, the, on this question in her afternoon speech tonight. She is the chair of the 21st Century China Program and a research professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. Previously, Professor Shirk served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of East Asia, Asia and Pacific Affairs at the US State Department with responsibility for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. Professor Shirk's Athenaeum speech is sponsored by the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Shirk to the Athenaeum. Well, it's uh, really a great pleasure to be back at CMC. I've spoken here before, and I have s taught graduates from the college, and uh, I know what a, a great student body it has and how interested people are in international affairs. I. Uh, before I start talking about China, I want to give a little paid advertisement for the school where I teach, which now is called the uh, School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. We're a graduate school, a professional graduate school in international affairs, and uh, focused on Asia and Latin America, which is unique in the United States. We do have new degrees, too, that we're starting next year in public policy, as well as international affairs, and a China research degree, master's degree, as well. So um, I'm the chair of the 21st Century China program at uh, the uh, GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. And uh, we have really built the 21st Century China program into the strongest group of scholars working on contemporary China. We, we have uh, 13 social scientists working on contemporary China. They're all first class scholars, and I really don't think there's any other school in the country that has the capabilities that we have. And we're interested in speaking outside the ivory tower to public policy and business issues that people really care about on the basis of serious empirical research, much of the research we do with Chinese counterparts, Chinese scholars. So it's really an exciting program. Go on the website, china.ucsd.edu, and uh, especially for those of you who are thinking about graduate school, you might want to think about uh, coming and studying at GPS. So, um, you know, I've been studying China for a very long time. I first traveled to China in 1971, right mm -hmm. after the ping pong team as the first group of Americans right after ping pong, even before uh, President Nixon traveled to China. And at that time, Mao Zedong still ruled China, and the Cultural Revolution was still raging in China. And even before 71, I'd been interviewing in Hong Kong, interviewing refugees who'd left China to try to learn about how uh, 
what life was like on the ground in China. And I learned about the human cost of Mao Zedong's extreme politicization of everyday life. And therefore, I observed with great hope uh, the reforms to China's economic and political system introduced by Mao's successor, Deng Xiaoping, beginning in the late 1970s after Mao died. True, the reforms on the economic front, replacing central planning with market competition and opening China's economy to the world, were much more prominent than the political reforms, but political reforms were, were real too. Less than four years after Mao died, Deng Xiaoping, and, and remember, Mao, Mao Zedong was the father of the country. He was the leader of the revolution and <coughs> the founder of the People's Republic. So less than four years after this larger-than-life figure had passed from the scene, Deng Xiaoping had the courage to critique the way he had been ruling China. He blamed China's problems not so much on Mao Zedong as an individual, but on the, what he called the over-concentration of power that gives rise to, quote, arbitrary rule by individuals at the expense of collective leadership. Mao's unchecked dictatorial power, his cult of personality, had allowed him to launch mass campaigns like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution that had tragic consequences, social and economic consequences for the Chinese people. Per capita income in China remained stagnant over all the years of Mao's rule and the loss of life in these mass campaigns was, you know, really tragic. These, so uh, Deng Xiaoping and many of his colleagues had the view that unchecked dictatorial power could result in catastrophe for China. It could take China off the cliff and it must never happen again. Because now, in Deng Xiaoping's view, the Chinese Communist Party must earn the support of people by modernizing the economy and improving living standards. Now, Deng never envisioned full electoral democracy or anything like that, but he did want to regularize and institutionalize the Chinese Communist Party to improve the way it governs China. And he introduced several important changes. First, fixed terms of office and a retirement age for senior officials, not tenure for life. In the past, you know, leaders just served until they were taken out feet first, either because they died or they were overthrown violently. Second, solve the problem of succession. Have a peaceful transfer of power from one leader to another. Third, delegate the authority for most policy making, especially in economic policy, from the party to the government, where officials were more competent, where they had more expertise about the sectors they were supposed to govern. And as he argued, quote, distinguish between the responsibilities of the party and those of the government and stop substituting the former for the latter. Next, select officials who were younger, better educated, and better qualified professionally and promote them through institutionalized methods. In other words, don't just promote people because they were politically virtuous, they had proved they were so loyal to Mao and the party, but instead 
try to find the best people, well-educated people, and promote them systematically. And finally, strengthen the collective institutions of the Communist Party, such as the Central Committee, the body of several hundred officials uh, who have, according to the party constitution, have the authority to select the senior leaders of the party and make uh, the most important decisions about strategy and policy. So strengthen the collective institutions rather than just have one man making all the decisions. Meet those institutions regularly on a regular schedule and um, encourage them to deliberate democratically. Okay. So these were all very important steps in the direction of a more institutionalized communist polity. And they were carried out step by step in the 1980s. Uh, in 1987, the Constitution was even revised to formally separate the party from the government and eliminate these kind of party leading groups that used to sit, and still sit now, actually, uh, in government ministries and departments. So delegate more authority to the government. But then in 1989, China had a crisis that almost brought down the regime. There were demonstrations, pro-democracy, anti-corruption demonstrations in more than 130 cities in China, mostly by young people, but not limited to young people. The leadership split on how to react to this, these, Christ, uh, these demonstrations, and the system really came to the brink of collapse. Deng Xiaoping ordered the People's Liberation Army to come in and use force to put down the demonstrations. They followed orders. Actually, at the time, there was speculation about splits in the military. Turned out not. There were a few dissenters, but by and large, they followed Deng's orders and put down the demonstrations, and the PRC survived. But after that crisis, some of the most influential leaders of the Chinese Communist Party diagnosed the problem of, you know, why did the regime almost collapse here? Why did people rise up to criticize problems like this? And they blamed it on the fact that the party had um, reduced its power over the government and over society. And so they made a U-turn uh, and reversed some of the delegation of authority from the party to the government, including this 1987 amendment about uh, eliminating the party groups within the government ministries. But many of the other institutional trends still continued, like fixed terms of office, like fit, um, peaceful transfer, of authority, succession, um, like regular meetings of the Central Committee. And after Deng Xiaoping, the following leaders of China, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, were not strongman leaders. They were just first among equals. And China made decisions in the party by a kind of collective leadership. Jiang Zemin retired in a peaceful transfer of power in 2002. I mean, he kept his military role for two more years, but he stepped down from his party leadership and government uh, presidency. And that was the first time this peaceful transfer of power had ever happened in a major communist country. So it was a remarkable achievement um, to change the system in that way, and obviously stabilize the system considerably, because succession is always a um, kind of a risk factor for the stability of a communist country because of the, pos the elite competition 
that could lead to a, a leadership split. Hu Jintao also retired peacefully, and he even gave up his uh, military commander-in-chief position in 2012. Now, Xi Jinping was chosen by the top leaders of the party uh, to succeed Hu Jintao in 2012, and they thought he would be sort of more or less the same as Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, meaning not a charismatic leader, not a person with a strong personal following, just a good team player who can manage collective leadership without trying to seek too much power for himself. And they thought it was a good idea to have a princeling, a son of one of the founding members of the Chinese Communist Party, the leaders of the revolution, people in the Deng Xiaoping, Mao Zedong generation. They thought having a leader who was in that kind of royal family of the Communist Party would be also a good thing because these are the people whose uh, all of their assets, meaning their corrupt assets, as well as just their security of them and their family would depend on the survival of party rule. In other words, they have their, um, they identify more with the survival of the party than just an ordinary politician. Everything, it's everything to them. So, Xi Jinping was basically chosen because he well, looked to be moderately competent and he was the princeling leader of the right age to move into a leadership position. Um, but Xi Jinping has surprised people in China and abroad by consolidating his personal authority in a way that we haven't seen since Mao Zedong. And people who know him say that he really has a sense of mission to save Chinese Communist Party rule in China. He wants to, he's been very spooked by what he knows about the fall of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. He wants to find ways to avoid that fate for the Chinese Communist Party. And in his view, people, leaders like Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao were mediocre imposters who were just kind of minding the store until princelings like Xi Jinping were of the proper age to come in and inherit power from their fathers the revolutionary founders. So Xi Jinping appears to be building his power, his personal power in China, in a, in a way that is modeled on Mao Zedong. And maybe it's a little bit of a combination of Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong, because he does espouse a platform of economic reform although those economic reforms have been not moving very quickly and there is some question about how strong his personal commitment is to the third wave of economic reform. But, you know, I was sort of puzzled on why he was uh, modeling himself on Mao Zedong given the tragic results of Mao Zedong's rule and given the fact that he himself and his family were the victims of Mao Zedong rule. But, um, and I still don't really have a complete answer to that question in my own mind, but it seems that he really doesn't have a lot of models of leadership that he's familiar with. And the one he knows best is the Mao model. And that's, that's the game plan he appears to be following. 
he has, he's ruling the country by leading a number of leading small groups, ad hoc uh, organizations that are interagency coordination bodies at best. <coughs> and he selected a few individuals who he really trusts to be the heads of the offices of these leading small groups on economic reform, on internal security, or the uh, National Security Council, which is mostly about internal security, less about international security, on cyber security. I think there's something like seven of these leading small groups and unusually, this is not the case for previous leaders, he made himself the head of all of them. Uh, China scholar, Australian China scholar, Jeremy Barme, calls Xi Jinping China's COE, chairman of everything. <laughs> now, of course, someone who wants to be chairman of everything may be actual chairman of nothing, because he does only have 24 hours in his day. He's not superhuman. And how does he actually manage all of these different policy areas? Uh, he has to delegate. But for Xi Jinping, he really appears to have a pretty low opinion of the professional bureaucrats in the government and even in the party. And so he's delegated to these few people he's plucked out of different uh, walks of life who he feels are really completely loyal to him and are able people and he's, he works through them. So he has to delegate, but he's not delegating to the normal ministries and party departments. Instead, to his kind of uh, you want to call it a kitchen cabinet or his informal uh, clique of people he likes that he's put in charge of these different or as his agents in managing these different leading small groups. The party has reclaimed control from the government under Xi Jinping. He wants the party to decide everything even if he can't decide everything. He wants the party to do it. And so the state council is really not doing much. It's kind of immobilized. And so much of the authority that had been delegated to it is come back to the party. And probably most uh, significant, Xi Jinping is carrying out this massive anti-corruption campaign against corrupt party and government officials. Um, in order to restore the integrity of the party so people will support the party. And I have to say it's been hugely popular with the public. The public was really fed up with corruption and they really respect a strong leader who is addressing the corruption problem head on. Now, the, uh, the way he's going after corruption is by his right-hand man, Wang Qishan, who heads up the Discipline Inspection Commission of the party. It's not being done by the legal system. And despite a lot of talk about strengthening rule of law in China, by and large, the legal system is uh, still not independent, still very much under the party, judges appointed by the party, and it's very mu much playing a secondary role to the Discipline Inspection Commission in this anti-corruption campaign. And although I believe that Xi Jinping is quite sincere in wanting to restore the integrity of the party through the anti-corruption campaign, you can't go after everyone. You have to pick your targets. And Xi Jinping appears to be using the anti-corruption campaign to basically 
destroy rival groups, anyone who could challenge his rule. So it's both what we would call in communist regimes a purge of political rivals as well as a genuine effort to clean up the party. And, you know, in these types of political systems, when you redistribute the spoils of office in the way Xi Jinping is doing, you are really asking for trouble. There is a potential of a backlash and a split in the leadership. Now, however, Xi Jinping has moved very um, adeptly to prevent such a backlash by establishing his authority over the military. Because you can't, if there was a split in the leadership, people would need to have the support of at least some people in the military. And Xi Jinping has moved to prevent that from happening by getting rid of a lot of high-level officers, generals, how many generals? 30 or some huge number of generals has been targeted in the anti-corruption campaign. Um, and most of what they're accused of is selling ranks within the military. I mean, just imagine how humiliating this is for the prestige of the People's Liberation Army. So Xi Jinping has apparently established authority over the military. And the other thing he's done is to go after the previous uh, internal security czar on an anti-corruption charges. And he himself is directly leading the internal police, the secret police, the internal security apparatus, which, of course, all of this is designed to pre prevent potential threats to his power. Um, political control over the media and civil society has also been ramped up. Uh, the Great Firewall has grown higher as the Cybersecurity Administration has worked to prevent people from using VPNs they use to jump over the firewall. And w inside the Great Firewall, uh, the censorship has also intensified on the internet and over the commercial media. The way Xi Jinping talks about this is using Cultural Revolution language. He talks about a struggle over public opinion and that he is playing hardball, fighting very hard to prevent the public from being seduced by ideas from foreign ideas, ideas that appear to be subversive to Communist Party rule. Talks a lot about hostile foreign forces and very critical of Western values and draw a very clear line between Chinese values and Western values. And he is mobilizing anti-foreign nationalism using, in particular, the maritime sovereignty disputes in the East China Sea and South China Sea to build popular support for the party and for Xi Jinping himself. Um, a lot of, Xi is also reviving a lot of Maoist ide ideological concepts and practices that we hadn't seen much of since uh, during this era of reform. So, um, The puzzle to me is how could this happen? How could we go back to personalistic dictatorship after quite a few decades of a more institutionalized governing system as introduced by Deng Xiaoping? And in a 
country characterized by market competition, opening to the world, a middle class, a growing middle class that sends their kids abroad to school and that travels internationally and with all the foreigners coming into China. I mean, how in this day and age, in this type of system that's become so cosmopolitan, among other things, how could a single leader achieve this amount of uh, personal control over the system? Um, it's, a, it's really a puzzle to me, and I've been trying to figure this out. And I've come to a tentative conclusion that Deng Xiaoping's project of institutionalizing governance in China just failed. It, w it just didn't work. Now, I mean, not everything has failed. You know, I was giving a talk um, last week, not exactly this talk, but it overlapped a bit with this topic. And uh, someone in the audience said, well, is Xi Jinping really completely revamping the system? Or is he just using the system to concentrate power? And so far, at least, it looks like it's really the latter. He hasn't stopped having central committee meetings. He, as far as we know, he will still step down after serving for 10 years. Um, you know, so we, although some people are speculating that might not be the case, that he might follow the Putin's lead in this respect. Um, so, but he is ruling in a different kind of way, in a more, uh, with more concentrated authority. And so, it seems to me that the, uh, the flaw of institutionalization of Communist Party rule as it was pursued by Deng Xiaoping is that the collective institutions of the party, like the Central Committee, are really unable to check, uh, di check uh, dictatorial rule. In other words, in a Leninist system, characterized by this type of structure, which is, of course, modeled on the Soviet Union, that there is a tendency to centralize decision-making power in the hands of a small group or one leader at the top. And that's because of the ambiguous relationship between the leaders and the collective institutions of the party. In an earlier book I wrote called The Political Logic of Economic Reform in China, I described the relationship between the top leadership and the Central Committee as something called reciprocal accountability. What does this mean? Sounds so jargony, political science jargon. Here's what it means. Formally speaking, the Central Committee has the authority to choose the top leaders. But who's in the Central Committee? It's ministers, the heads of government ministries, the heads of party departments, governors and party secretaries of provinces, and senior military uh, officers, basically. And all of those people got their jobs because they were appointed by the top leadership. So they uh, are in the Central Committee, they have their jobs because they've been appointed by the top leadership. But in turn, they have the power to choose the top leadership. Here's the right uh, analogy. Think about the Vatican. It's like the relationship between the Pope and the College of Cardinals. The Pope appoints the Cardinals, but the Cardinals select the Pope. It's reciprocal accountability, but Obviously, the top-down authority of the leadership over 
the Central Committee is stronger than the bottom-up authority of the Central Committee over the leaders. So the Central Committee, which is the selectorate, they do get to uh, choose the leaders, but they do not have sufficient independent power to, um, uh, to check autocratic leadership, basically. The collective institutions of the party do not have enough independent power. Uh, and because splits in the leadership are seen as so dangerous, factional conflict and splits in the leadership, there is a demand for loyalty on the part of all of those officials and a lot of talk about we have to preserve party unity. And they use external threats to justify party unity. So what does this mean? It means that even when you meet the Central Committee more regularly, when you have fixed terms of office, you still have insufficient checks on this tendency to concentrate power in the hands of a dictatorial leader. So um, I'm, this is something I'm really trying to get to the bottom of now in my own research. I'm working on a book with some colleagues comparing China, North Korea, Vietnam, and Cuba, and the way communist institutions have evolved in all these countries to try to understand what is the tension between the institutionalization of governance in these kinds of systems and personalistic dictatorship. Now, uh, there are interesting policy implications about Xi Jinping's ability to concentrate so much power. Um, and maybe this, we should save that for the question and answer session. We could talk a little bit about his foreign policy as well as his domestic policy. You know, on the one hand, having a leader with a lot of power in his own hands can be a good thing because he might be able to take bold moves in a positive direction and exercise restraint over the military and a lot of other bureaucracies that otherwise could uh, do provocative things in international arena. And I think we saw a good example of that in his uh, having this summit with the leader of Taiwan, Ma Zhou, last week. That was a very bold thing to do. It had never been done before. And it probably takes a leader willing to take some risks and do something new like Xi Jinping. But we also see him uh, using nationalism by uh, stoking uh, you know, really showing resolve over these maritime sovereignty disputes in a way that could get China in, tr in trouble and lead to direct military confrontation. Um, internally, what we see is that political reform agenda is basically dead in China. Nothing's happening. And now I look back on some of the things Hu Jintao was trying to do, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, they look pretty good about increasing transparency and some accountability, but all of that is stalled out. Nothing's happening. And as I mentioned earlier, everyone was hoping, well, gee, Xi Jinping is consolidating his personal power because he's really gonna ram through a new wave of market reform against all the vested interests. And so far, it doesn't look like that's happening. So um, I'm eager to hear your questions and your thoughts and um, look forward to a good discussion. Thanks very much.
We now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone. As always, priority will go to students. Thank you for the talk. It's very informational. Um, I'd like to know what's up with um, Xi Jinping touring all over the world, spending money, contracts with uh, Germany to, for planes, I believe, Boeing, and I'm sorry, um, Airbus planes, uh, is making contracts in England, visiting Obama. It seems like he's going around the world spending money. Well, I think when Xi Jinping came into office in uh, 2012, he looked around and he felt like, gosh, China doesn't really have any friends. Uh, China had alienated a lot of its neighbors after decades of very effective diplomacy making friends with its neighbors, trying to show them that China was not a threat. The focus on these sovereignty disputes had really uh, eroded a lot of that good feeling and alienated a lot of China's neighbors who started seeing China as more of a threat. And uh, so when he looked around the region, you know, he felt like, well, maybe Russia you know, maybe Cambodia, you know, uh, he just couldn't find any friends. And in, so he has been actively trying to go and reassure other countries about China's intentions and to use economic diplomacy to try to build good relations with other countries. So uh, making major purchases of aircraft or other things, Chinese investment that it intends to put into the UK and other places, these are the tools of Chinese diplomacy. And, you know, I think that's fine. I think that's, that's logical. I mean, one of the other problems he faces is China doesn't have a lot of soft power. Uh, you know, the, even though people really respect Chinese culture tremendously, Chinese history and culture, but the Chinese system as it is today doesn't really have a lot of soft power, even though they work quite hard through Confucius Institutes and Chinese media and stuff to build soft power, but it hasn't been working very well. So economic diplomacy is probably their most effective method of making friends. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for your very informative talk. Um, I'm interested in, you were saying how uh, Xi believes the previous leaders were kind of almost caretakers for the proper leaders, the princelings, the, uh, the descendants of the original uh, revolutionaries came to power and yet you're talking about how he's also centralizing power within himself. Is there any visible dissent or blowback within the Prince Thing faction about this, or has it remained relatively united throughout this process? Good question. Um, you know, Chinese elite politics are very opaque, and you'll meet all sorts of people who think they know what's going on because of rumor. Rumors are rampant. When you don't have journalism that actually reports what's going on, people have to rely on rumor. And I have heard two very different accounts of whether or not there is ongoing resistance to Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, his purge, and his effort to centralize power. One version says that Jiang Zemin, the previous, previous leader, uh, who had a very large following because he appointed a lot of people during the 10 years he was in power, um, that 
he and his faction are actively resisting, and that Zhang even confronted Xi Jinping at a high-level meeting at Beidaihe this summer. And this is somebody who's an, a highly respected expert on Chinese domestic politics. Another highly respected expert on Chinese domestic politics is completely convinced that she has decapitated all the factions and that Zhang doesn't dare confront Xi Jinping. A, first of all, he's really quite elderly. Secondly, his son and his close followers have not been targeted by the anti-corruption campaign, but they could be any minute. They've been left out there as kind of hostages. And if Xi Jinping, I mean, if Jiang Zemin makes trouble for Xi Jinping, they will be. So, so this is where the study of Chinese politics has come, that we have, uh, you know, these two, we're debating, is Jiang Zemin resisting, is he challenging Xi Jinping or not? And I'm kind of intrigued by thinking about other folks who might be um, uh, losing out or the victims or the losers in Xi Jinping's effort. But <clears throat> every leader that I mentioned to other people, they have reasons why that would never happen. So I don't know. It's remarkably easy for this guy to centralize power. And that's really, it's like a stress test of Chinese Communist Party institutions, and it's failing. They're failing. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, you mentioned in your speech that it was a bold move for President Xi to meet with President Ma last weekend in Singapore. I was wondering if you could talk more about that, like what are some of his motives in setting up the meeting, or what are some of the implications for China and its domestic audience? Thanks. Well, you know, this is a historic event, really. And I think it was a very good way for Xi Jinping to elevate his prestige domestically as a statesman leader. You know, obviously any Chinese leader who actually achieves reunification with Taiwan would go down in history as, you know, one of the greatest leaders of China. So it looks like a step toward reunification from the standpoint of the domestic public and on the mainland. And um, uh, so I think that's a very important motivation. The second one is that he wanted to change the subject from China's uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea and other kinds of provocative steps that China was taking in foreign policy to try to enhance China's international reputation as a peacemaker and a benevolent country. So change the subject. And then the third reason was a kind of last ditch effort to try to save the Guomindang's prospects for the upcoming presidential campaign uh, election that's going to happen next month in Taiwan, where you know everyone is quite confident that the Guomindang, the ruling current ruling party in Taiwan, is going to lose that election, and that Tsai Ing-wen, the candidate from the DPP, the party that still has Taiwan independence in its party constitution, is going to win the election. So I think he's hoping to try to create pressure on Tsai Ing-wen, the next president of Taiwan, to 
continue dialogue and, and not move Taiwan more toward legal independence? Hi, Professor. Thanks so much for coming. I was just wondering if you saw uh, Xi's consolidation of power having any effect on the ethnic minority populations in China, particularly Tibet and the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Well, there's no sign that Xi Jinping is bold enough to actually uh, revise China's the central government and party's approach to Tibet and Xinjiang. You know, it, basically he's doubling down on a uh, strike hard campaign in Xinjiang to uh, combat forces who favor more autonomy, but of course he and others depict them as all terrorists. Now, there are terrorists in Xinjiang. There, we found there were terrorists training in Al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan. There are Uyghurs from Xinjiang who have affiliated with terrorist organizations outside of Xinjiang. And there have been terrorist incidents in Xinjiang and in other parts of China. But undoubtedly, this is a small group in Xinjiang. And most people uh, don't support the terrorists, but they also don't, are extremely alienated from Chinese rule in Xinjiang. I visited there this summer, and um, it's like a colonial situation where the people of Xinjiang feel um, powerless and resentful of Chinese rule. In Tibet, it's more or less the same. And, um, but it's, it's different, of course, because you don't have the same connection with international terrorist groups. And uh, Xi Jinping, is, as far as I can tell, hasn't been particularly creative coming up with new approaches to try to address the situation in Xinjiang and Tibet. And we don't see any sign of interest in having dialogue with the Dalai Lama, which would be, which, you know, I think Jiang Zemin actually was flirting with the idea and then didn't do it. But it would be a valuable thing to do because the Dalai Lama is not promoting Tibet independence. He wants greater religious freedom and autonomy for the Tibetan people. And after the Dalai Lama is gone, future leaders of the Tibetan government in exile are likely to be more radical, more rigid than the Dalai Lama. So if you could stabilize the situation with the Dalai Lama, it would be a smart thing to do. But no Chinese leader has yet had the um, the vision to do that. I'm a doctor student from Taiwan. Uh, in your speech, you mainly uh, contribute the uh, strengthening dictatorship to President uh, Xi Jinping. But some may argue that actually that's kind of structural or environmental issue. Uh, in recent years, some scholars or some decision makers uh, from David Shempo or Andrew Nathan. From or, where? From where? Uh, David Shempo of George Washington or the Andrew Nathan. Oh, David Shempo, yes, okay. Or from Columbia or the Michael uh, Biosupri of the security issue and the even President Obama. They changed their attitude toward China. Uh, some may argue that, especially in US or in Japan, they may say that since 1970s, uh, US or Europe or Japan actually contribute to the development of US and even the so-called catch-22 situation right now. The what? What's the catch-22 situation. Catch-22. Yes, how the freedom world uh, deal with China. Because 
actually knew suppose China. So uh, some may wonder that uh, from some uh, scholars or to decision makers, how they describe or how they portray China. Uh, is there any systematic problem of how people see China? So uh, if they have some, okay, we say there are some so-called panda herder or the red team. They are more uh, China friendly. So when they make the decision, maybe uh, they will not like to make decision like they make toward Russia, Soviet Union. So if China get everything, okay, they enter WTO, they host two Olympics, they get almost everything. So why should they change course? The Burma or the Myanmar, you still have some sanction against them. So you have the Aung San Suu Kyi's victory these days. But for China, there's no incentive. If you don't have any pressure, why should they change? So if we say that's a personal issue, maybe we should say it's a more structural or environmental issue. So is there any systematic problem in the scholar or the, this field of China study? Thank you. Well, actually, my argument was that it's, um, it's a structural issue. I, I really was not um, focusing so much on Xi Jinping, the individual, but the failure of institutionalization to check the tendency toward centralization of power in this type of system. But um, as to the role of U.S. policy, um, you know, right now there is, as you observed, a very intense debate among China experts about whether or not our policy toward China has worked or not. Has, you know, maybe our policy has been wrong. Maybe we've taken the wrong tack. Maybe we have, as you say, kind of facilitated China's rise, even sponsored China's rise, its membership in the WTO. We've lavished respect for China. We've uh, given China a seat at every table and every grouping and encourage China to grow stronger economically. And some people would say, gee, you know, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe we should take a more direct containment approach to try to keep China weak because China, a strong China, will threaten U.S. interests. So right now, there's a lot of active discussion about U.S. policy toward China. I, I myself am chairing a task force on U.S. policy toward China. There's just a lot of discussion now because we're re-examining our previous assumptions. Um, thank you, Professor, for your talk. Uh, my question is that during your speech, you mentioned that China is trying to make friends right now. And so, so what, are some, what are some of the reasons that it antagonized neighboring countries at the moment for, with the marine sovereign issues? Why has it antagonized other yeah, countries? Yeah, so what are the reasons? Because okay, I think well, that, yeah. um, I think it's, uh, it's largely because More generically, China has used uh, kind of coercive diplomacy in these sovereignty disputes. Well, first of all, it's elevated the importance of these sovereignty disputes um, even higher than its own national security. So sovereignty over security. And that's a change. Previously, China negotiated its land border disputes with its neighbors, with the exception of one remaining one with India. It negotiated all of those land borders 
in a very accommodating manner that improved relations with its neighbors, but by giving up, by compromising and giving up a certain amount of territory. But now China is elevating the importance of these little islands in the East China Sea and the South China Sea and um, allowing Coast Guard type vessels and fishing boats and even the Navy and Air Force to uh, claim, well, not so much to claim new islands, which it has done before. There have been military confrontations, but to expand, it, uh, to sort of harden its claim over the, the land features that it has controlled uh, by building these artificial islands. And um, also it uh, has a claim to the entire South China Sea, what's the so-called Nine Dash Line. And that claim is really not consistent with the international UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. They talk about a kind of historic claim to the South China Sea. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea really only deals with the land features in the sea, having EEZs, exclusive economic zones. So what it means is that there are these other claimants to parts of the South China Sea that China is now claiming for itself. So there is a, just a conflict of interest between other claimants in China. And whereas in the 1990s and 2000s, China was willing to negotiate a code of conduct, an agreement on a code of conduct about how to manage these conflicting claims it has basically refused to continue negotiating that code of conduct. And uh, it has violated the code of conduct by these artificial islands and new building structures. So that's, uh, and it appears that it's putting these sovereignty claims ahead of good relations with its neighbors. So it's not just about the South China Sea but its behavior there is being seen as a indication of what kind of rising power we're dealing with and what are China's long-term intentions. Sorry for the long answer. Hi, my name is Belinda. I'm an international relations major at Pomona College. Mm -hmm. um, first, thank you so much for your talk. I remember last year um, in Professor Pei's Chinese politics class, we discussed a lot about the lack of um, checks and balances in this, within the CCP. So um, my question is, do you think that moving towards the rule of law will solve the issue of this lack of checks and balances? And how likely do you think that um, this reforming of the legal system will be? Uh, I think that's a really good question. And I think um, that an independent legal system would be a very important check on the power of the party and of individual leaders. Um, you know, there are a lot of laws on the books in China including laws that would enable citizens to sue the government, administrative law. And, yet, and sometimes it even happens. But uh, people can't consistently count on fair hearing and judgment from the courts. So, uh, you know, it, it would be very, very important and I, I also feel that whereas nobody expects China to introduce democratic elections anytime soon, it's really quite important that China now establish the preconditions for a stable democracy later. And 
what I mean by that is a legal system, civil society, and um, an independent media. Because if you just, if China were to have some crisis and suddenly democratic forces took over and tried to establish a democracy in China, that democracy might very well fail and revert back to autocracy, just as many new democracies have in other parts of the world. Because without a legal system and an independent media and a civil society that would help democracy function well, then it really might not work. Hi, Professor, thank you for being here. My question is, do you see the TPP and China's exclusion as um, upsetting the regional balance of power in any significant way? Do I see CCP? TT, or TPP. Oh, TPP, upsetting the regional balance of power. Um, I mean, I think many people would see it as a way of strengthening the balance of power and see it as a effort to balance China's rising power on the part of the United States. I think it's kind of unfortunate that this trade agreement has come to be viewed in geopolitical strategic terms. Um, because the original idea was that any country could join if it could meet the standard. And I think that's the, you know, the best way to go. And I think the door should remain open to China to join TPP. There's a lot of discussion in China now, and there has been over the past several years about why it might be good for the Chinese economy to join TPP. So, um, you know, I've worked so long to try to find some basis for US and China to cooperate and to avoid a Cold War antagonism between the two countries, that it doesn't make me happy to see uh, even trade agreements get framed in this, uh, in this uh, rivalry framework. So uh, I would hope that we might leave the door open to China and TPP. Thank you. Um, hi, Professor. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm a first year student at CMC, and I'm from Shanghai, China. So uh, my question is, do you think there will be a leader after Xi Jinping that will be mild as, you know, like uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao? Because I feel like this is kind of a circle, you know, mild, secure, and empowered government. And when people feel like you are exercising dictatorship, and there comes, um, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, and when people feel like, where's our leader? You know, you're being too mild, and right. there comes President Xi Jinping. So do you think this is kind of how China operates its political system and improve the political system in the future? Thank you. That's a really good question. So in other words, you're seeing it in a kind of cyclical way, uh, correcting the mistakes the problems with the last administration, which is sort of the way we elect presidents. Um, look, I think, uh, I think that's possible. It's hard to say what comes after Xi Jinping. It's a long time from now to 2022, which is when he's supposed to step down if he serves two terms. So, um, but I do think that people welcomed stronger leadership now. You're absolutely right about that. People felt that Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao in particular were weak and that they weren't disciplining the bureaucracy. It was sort of going off in his own directions and there was a lack of coordination, a lack of progress on economic reform. Corruption got worse and worse. 
you know, there are a lot of problems and people thought we need a strong leader, just like in, in America, people want a strong leader. But I don't think they want a leader as unchecked um, as we have in China today. And I think that especially some of the uh, controls over the media, the way the anti-corruption campaign is being pursued, these things I think are also cause some folks to have some concerns. Um, and there are many people who don't like to hear this kind of Mao era rhetoric either. Seems like a throwback that's sort of out of keeping with how cosmopolitan China is today. So, um, you know, they may prefer a different type of leader after Xi Jinping. We have time for one last question. If no one else is going for it, um, I have one myself. So you touched on Chinese media on a couple of occasions. When you're looking at the future, what do you see, see as the near term and then also longer term overarching um, kind of dynamics? Are there possibilities that it's going to open up more? Or is, is there going to be just more um, setbacks on freedom of speech um, and also like the blogosphere? On the media, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I edited a book on this called Changing Media, Changing China. And, you know, uh, in America, we focus so much on censorship. And I actually argued in that book, in my introduction, it's an edited book, that the commercialization of the media, moving from a party press that is just subsidized by the government and party, to one that where the newspapers and magazines and TV stations and internet sites, they have to attract advertising by getting audiences. So the media has really changed its style, for sure in an effort to attract readers. And that means that they also try to report things that previously they were not able to report, even protests. So, um, and certainly international events that they want to report. So, um, people have a lot more information than they used to have, but the trend now is that the propaganda department, and it's beyond me why a 21st century China needs a propaganda department. You know, um, but the propaganda department is uh, showing why it's needed by just censoring like mad. And I think it's very frustrating for people and what it means is, I, I think it can be dangerous too, because even the elite don't necessarily have the understanding of how people outside of China are viewing what's going on in China. I mean, I was in China recently at a very interesting meeting with some very high level people who didn't seem to understand how the stock market debacle the way that they pumped up the stock, mar stock market through, I mean, politically pumped up the stock market. And then when it started, as it would, of course, have to do eventually, started dropping, they intervened too soon. So it really caused a lot of uh, concern outside of China about how competent are these guys anyway? I mean, we, we've always thought that the economic policy makers of China were very competent. And that gave people a lot of confidence in China's economic future. But this was really mismanaged by any standard. And people in China, the, these very senior people, 
seemed like they were not aware of the, all the discussion in Western media about this at all. So I, I do worry that building up the Great Firewall and all the censorship is creating a kind of propaganda echo chamber inside China where people are not really getting the knowledge they need to make good decisions, either at the elite level or at the mass level. Please join me in thanking Professor Sujan Shirk. Thank you.